name is Claire Weichler, and I grew up in the Metau, um, went to college in Maine where I created these pieces and did a whole thesis about glaciers and climate change and artwork in the North Cascades. Um, so today I'll talk about my project and describe the three scrolls that are being shown at Metau Arts and that kind of um, exemplify the project and what I learned. For me, creating artwork has always been a way of processing information around me and st having studied environmental science in school and being exposed to all of these rapid changes from like wildfire to drought and changes in our winters. It's, those things are all very personal and I think art is the way that I have um, really been able to think through and process those changes and especially in printmaking when I spend so long carving a wooden block or working with copper or whatever material I'm developing um, that methodical and technical process of just creating the marks is where I can truly think through some of the change and data that I've, I've been exposed to. For me Art is a really valuable tool in communicating science and I have kind of leaned away from like data art and directly depicting data um, and used art more as a tool to capture things that surround the data, whether like that are less quantifiable um, and then to dig into what, what those things mean to me and to my community and the people around me. And so in creating these scrolls, I, I gathered bits and pieces of, um, from scientific reports and my own experiences collecting data with the North Cascades Glacier Climate, Glacier Climate Project, which has been running for almost 40 years now in the North Cascades, tracking 10 specific glaciers' responses to climate change. Got to be a glaciologist and measure um, specific metrics of glacier change and hang out with really amazing climate scientists and communicators. Um, so that was a really fundamental point of this project where I was learning a ton and rapidly developing relationship with these like five different glaciers that we visited. So in connection with science, art is a really powerful tool to express our own experiences and emotion with change. Um, back in 2017, I had this really powerful experience um, in, in Patagonia where I was using the most updated, most recent maps of a landscape and tra doing this traverse and all of the glaciated areas on the map that we got to were just rubble fields, like exposed moraine um, with no glacier in sight. And that experience of being in a landscape that was so rapidly changing, seemingly like unnoticed, um, really made me more interested in, in glaciers and, and their change and the impacts of their change. Um, and also made me appreciative of, of that change in certain ways, like these fields of rubble and uh, rocks and silt are interesting in themselves. Um, the shattering of ice at night that we could hear in our tents was beautiful. Um, the, the colors of, of of the water where all the glacial sediment has washed in are gorgeous. Um, and all of those experiences, like the sound, the, the texture, and the colors, um, I think, yeah, in, my, in, in your own sketchbook or memories, those things might be what you, like non-scientifically, are, are using as parameters of change. Um, and that really comes through in some of my artwork where I'm drawing from just personal felt experience, whether that's the color of the sunset through the wildfire smoke or the glacial streams and the sound of milk. Um, so yeah, that was back way back in 2017. And then in 2020, I joined the North, North Cascades Glacier Climate Project and did a bunch of independent field work over the summer and then spent the following school year writing my thesis and developing this artwork. And in my thesis, I examined the ways that 
Scientists communicate glacier change um, through their graphs and photographs and data and the ways that climate artists or just artists generally interested in the environment portray glaciers and came to identify all these different narratives that come up in the art world around glaciers, how they're framed and used to, as symbols of climate change or talked about as ruins or dying. Um, and so, yeah, doing that background work really informed the way that the narratives that I wanted to show in my work and the possibilities I wanted to leave open. Um, and so these scrolls are pretty jumbled and chaotic and they show a lot of different possibilities or perspectives. Um, and they also utilize many different techniques and imagery in hopes that, I don't know, someone can connect with part of them in some way. So within each of the scrolls, one, two, and then three, which is out of the frame, there's this idea that our high alpine glaciers trickle down, like there's these these stream flows kind of that trickle down to um, environments that we're more familiar with or live in and species throughout that chain of um, melting water. So in scroll one, I am incorporating some information from the archives and like explorers or oral indigenous storytelling um, that show some like earlier relationships with ice, like spirit quests of volcanoes and, ex and experiencing environmental change to like treks across the mountains to find passable routes in which like the terrain is described as horrible and terrible and fr or like sublime and incredible and just completely overwhelming. Um, so there's this big spectrum of experiences which I incorporated just like fragments of quotes in the scroll and then also tried to depict some of the different ways of knowing that people have um, used and recorded glaciers with from photography to um, these like patterns of loss where the, the, the extent of the glacier is, is shown over time. Yeah, and then different, different patterns of retreat and also experiences um, gathering huckleberries or mountaineering and yeah quantifying glacial change in the in the western science realm as well as just other people's um, understandings and, and knowledge so yeah scroll one has this historical lean in black and white and blues that I created to kind of synthesize my understanding of the background um, of the landscape. The second scroll is most, mostly about my personal experience um, doing glacier research and being out in the field in the summer of 2020. And I am weaving together aspects of this, this experience from like the high alpine and those like from the glaciers at the top of Mount Baker um, all the way to the like meadows and places that we're more familiar with, the rivers that flow into the sea. Um, and this kind of stream of sediment and ideas runs through all the scrolls where I'm connecting like, like shifting scales and also connecting like high, al high alpine to, to lower down. So this happens both in the field and when you look at these works, you're shifting from like the minutia of an ice crystal to the the, the view of an entire glaciated landscape and that that kind of like connecting causes the viewer or whoever's engaged with that experience to to process the, the change and, and things differently um, and to be able to relate the little little experiences to the whole it's yeah it's it's highly filtered through my own experience and one example of that is how the colors that I selected for this are matched to photographs I took of um, like the Alpen glow in on the on the glaciers and the colors of silt and mud and and water in in glacial 
um, lake basins. I, like I'm sure that this print has also faded a little bit, so those colors, those colors are changing, but originally they were matched to um, something real and experienced and kind of whimsical because the colors that get bounced off of ice are so somewhat phenomenal. And also when, there's, when you're up there in August and there's wildfire smoke um, affecting how this, the, the hues of the sun. Um, so although color may not be like a scientifically quantifiable metric of change, I think for the ordinary person and the viewer, it's, it's one that people really respond to and um, use in their own memories of, of what this place was and um, how it changes. So I also incorporate some of these species that I found to describe my, or that I, that I was able to connect to. And so thinking about the pika and its vulnerability to warming weather, um, its dependence upon deep snowpack for insulation in the winter, and then also its intolerance of temperatures above, I think, 70 degrees, where it can actually just die from being overheated. Um, those little like sentinels of the Alpine with their, <coughs> their, their screech are so iconic in our experience of the North Cascades. And they're lingering with them and their story can tell us a lot about the change to come and, and how to adapt or where to move and that kind of thing. And then the salmon embossed here and, and printed here and its relationship to glaciated watersheds is really interesting. So here I have printed the three forks of the Nooksack River that stem from like Mount Baker, which would be around here if you were looking at it as a map, this being north. And so the north fork of the Nooksack is the most glaciated and has the coldest water, which is the best for the Pacific salmon. And the south fork has lost its glaciers. They're gone. And it has the warmest water. And um, there's a lot of work going on to increase the hospitability of that river for salmon by creating um, log jams and changing the flow. But glaciers are this like overarching factor in what will continue to be inhabitable um, for those species. And, and up at the way top, we have the raven, which is mostly a symbol of resilience. It can basically live anywhere, survive through hot and cold. Um, the mountain goat, which depends upon snowpack to cool down in the summer. You'll see them just lying in the snow on a hot August day around Mount Baker. Um, and then, yeah, we've got some scientists making measurements and connecting the, yeah, the, high, the lower strands of the river and hydrology there with, with the accumulation and crevassing and those different patterns on the ice itself. So moving from the past in scroll one to my present experience in scroll two, and naturally the third scroll would examine the future or imagine the world that will come to be with, with melting glaciers and, and changing ecologies. And this act of like worlding and imagining a future and speculating is really loose and really open. And the more that we do it, the more we free ourselves from um, our, like a fixed reality and can imagine like good things as well as dark things. But in, in a lot of climate change art, it's very focused on doom and gloom and um, the death of a glacier or um, like an oil-soaked pelican or these things that really suppress our ability to act because we're so bogged down in sorrow and grief. And although those emotions and processes are important, we also need something that can spark us to imagine and be hopeful. Like in my first experience, really experiencing glacier change, um, there was that, that sorrow of, of not being able to experience that glacier that was there just 40 years ago, but also some sort of awe at the life that was already springing and the first plant species colonizing the, the silty moraines. And observing those changes is a way to find hope in our future. And so 
this scroll takes some of those ideas and speculations and just wild guesses at what our future might look like. And it's cast in like these jewel tones that I hope that are hopeful and um, encouraging. And so, yeah, a few elements of this are while on the Eastern Glacier, we found all of this trash, like treads from snowmobiles and pocket knives and plastic. And plastic is so universal um, now in every environment from like microplastics in Alpine lakes to the ocean um, and everywhere in between. But it's particularly, it moves in our, through our waterways in interesting ways. So I think like part of this is imagining ways that plastics become part of the ecosystem, which might not be realistic or um, probably be very bad, but <laughs> who knows? Like maybe, maybe there's some wave of species that will come to eat plastics and do that kind of thing. So like you can think really far out and, um, and, and just in that act of being a little more open to possibilities, we can approach our future in a more enthusiastic way. It gives us more energy to act. It gives us um, more creative ideas on, on paths to take, even, though, even if many of them are dead ends. And during this process of deglaciation, there are so many new and surprising opportunities to explore the landscape. So this like rope coil is kind of a symbol of the ways that people might explore these landscapes like mountaineering and climbing and there will be new routes. There will be first and last ascents of certain places um, because those mountains are changing so swiftly. There's also these huckleberry pickers who will come to probably find their huckleberries in, in new fields and new places as um, temperatures warm and glaciers retreat and habitat shifts. There's like this bright orange marmot who might like, I don't know, the idea of toxins in our ecosystems from like microplastics or other things. Um, you, can, you can measure like atmospheric pollutants within glacial ice. Um, and then of course it's running through the water system in different ways, but like the toxified marmot and the <laughs> like radioactive ice crystals and, and things. It's, it's just a way of toying with potential futures and you can engage with um, frightening futures at the same time that you're imagining ways to cope with them or move, move through them and, and still find hope and joy in, in, our, in our beautiful backyard. Combined, these, these three scrolls are like a little glimpse into three, three, three points of our glacial history. And I hope that um, as, I, as I have found the act of like observing, the act of living in kind of this period of environmental collapse or catastrophe, as some people say it, call it, requires and inspires close observation. And it can be as, as small as like the plants that grow between your sidewalks, stones, or um, your experience in the high alpine. But whatever it is, noticing and recording or making memories of um, those shifting colors, textures, species, and remaining open to the stories that other species have to tell us, like the pica or the white bark pine or these other species grappling with climate change um, can teach us all a lot and inspire an artistic practice or just a practice of getting to know our changing world. So I hope, I hope you enjoyed that presentation and are inspired to take note of the climate changing around us in maybe some new ways, knowing that the more we can observe and imagine, the more possibilities we're creating. Um, and I would love to answer any questions that you have. So thank you so much for coming. <laughs>